Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, just by way of introductions, my name's Helen. I work as part of the national team at Street Games, heading up our intervention teams. Um, and I'll be working alongside Kelly today, who will be kind of tutoring and running us through um, the bulk of the session. Um, just before we start, it'd be really useful just to kind of give us an idea of who's in the room. Um, could you just um, maybe just put in the chat, I stick your hands up if you've got your camera on, if you would class yourself as already being part of the Street Games Network, just to get an idea of whether we've got a totally new people to Street Games or whether maybe some of you, bit, bit, oh, thumbs up, that's a good one. I never thought of that. Thumbs up if you are, um, keep your thumbs off if you're not. Okay, so we've got a couple of people that are, um, we've got, uh, Another couple of street game staff, so Mark Oliver, morning Mark, Mark heads up our work in the northeast at the moment, and we've got a new a new recruit, um, another Mark who's just joined the intervention team at Street Games and is kind of using this as part of his induction process as well. And from what I can see, we've got a mixture of people on the call from local authorities, from NGBs, possibly from other kind of community-based projects. Um, so a really good mix of people this morning. Um, so I guess I think this session, irrespective of whether you are familiar with street games, whether you're familiar with doorstep sport or not, or actually you kind of you know a bit about it, I think what this session is really trying to do is introduce the concept of doorstep sport in terms of what it is, what is it all about, um, and what are the key components of a, do a good doorstep sport session. Um, and for those of you that have been on other conference workshops this week or maybe listen to their plenaries you've probably heard the words doorstep sport quite a bit um, and you might be thinking yeah I think I know what that is activity close to where young people live but actually like what is it what does it look like what what is a good what is a good doorstep sport offer and um, for us at street games doorstep sport is really the big what we do it's central to all of our work and we know from kind of 10, 11, 12 years of, of delivering and working with partners that actually a good quality doorstep sport offer can enable young people to um, kind of develop sporting capital, to really increase their levels of physical, physical activity, but actually also help them to develop as a person as well. So, and, and improve their life chances. So what we want to really do today is kind of introduce the basics of what is doorstep sport, what does it look like? What are the components that make a good doorstep sport session to enable young people to get involved, stay, in, stay involved and, and reap the benefits? So that's kind of the basics. And then, so Kelly's gonna run us through that bit and then I'll just tie it off at the end with a, a little bit about what it means to be part of the Street Games Network. Um, what, what are you part of? What are we trying to do as a movement? And then a, a couple of things, a couple of tangibles about how to actually go about it. So, Kel, I think that's it from me for now. I'm going to hand over yeah, fab. the bulk. Yeah, fab. So I suppose in true um, Street Games fashion, we are going to do a little bit of an icebreaker. Uh, it's a bit of an active one, only slightly so. And I can see, obviously, some of you have not been able to turn your cameras on. If there's any opportunity, just to turn it on for a couple of minutes. I'd say do it now, but don't worry if not. You can pop it in the chat box. We're going to play a game of heads or tails. We all like a little bit of light competition. Um, and I think, you know, given that we're Thursday, we're two thirds throughout the week, I think we could probably do with something just to sort of keep us going. So we're going to have a little bit of a line competition. We're going to play a game of heads or tails. So you'll have all played this before, you know, simple toss of a coin. You know, we're going to go best of three and we're going to have a, a test run first and foremost. So those of you who can't put your cameras on, all I'd like you to do is I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust that you're going to play fair. And I'm just going to say, pop it in the in the chat box and just let me know whether you're going to go with heads or tails. We'll all lock in and then we'll uh, we'll see what the coin says. So we're going to go for a test first. This is just a, a check to see everyone's, you know, playing by the same rules and we've all got the game. So if you think the coin toss is going to go heads, I'd like you to do this. So your two hands on your head is going to be this. If you think it's tails, we're just going to go this. This is our online version because we can't uh, get our tails in any other way. So um, I would like you to lock in your votes. Are you going to go heads or tails? What do you think it's going to be? 
I'm going to give you the last five seconds just to get all of those coming in through the chat box. Well, we've got one for heads, one for tails. The last two are going for heads, right? It is heads. So well done, Nigel. Well done, Phil. Well done, Chris, Nicola. And I think we had one more, John, in the head. So that was a test. You're all in. You're all back in the game. You've all got another go. So we're going to go best of three now. And so our first go, you're all back in the game. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to lock in. Is it heads or is it tails? In the chat box as well. Let's get your votes in. Moynell's going heads. Chris is going tails. All right, I'm going to toss. Who is staying in? Right, it's heads again. Nigel, feel you went again all in. Who have we got? Nicola, Moynal, John, you're all in to stay in to write. I want you to metaphorically or literally pick someone to support. So uh, who is it out of the team that you're going to support? Give us a quick hands up who's actually still in. Right, amazing. It's top four and a couple in our chat box. All right, you've got 10 seconds. Let lock your next votes in. What are you going with? Feel sticking. Nigel's changed his options right it's tails Nigel you pick right <laughs> we're gonna go for a winner takes all now so who have we got left in Darren were you in Nigel were you in anyone left in in our chat box Moynal right it is between Nigel Darren and Moynal by the looks of it so you're all gonna have to pick something different Nigel's locking in early right you've got 10 seconds Darren's going tails Moyno, what are you going for? Heads. Right, let's go. Right, the winner is Darren. Quick round of applause. Darren Jim, the winner takes it all. Well done, Darren. Excellent, excellent. Great participation team. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for joining in on that. And yeah, just to give you, I suppose, a little bit of a flavour of one of probably the things that's quite fundamental to doorstep sport, and that is having a bit of fun. Uh, we still like to have that competition. We still like to get everyone involved. But yeah, that fun is that fundamental, foremost kind of element of our doorstep sport. So we'll take you through a little bit just to get started, I suppose, of why is there a need really for doorstep sport? Why, where's it kind of come from? Why, I suppose, did street games first and foremost get together to put doorstep sport together? So we're just going to have a look at kind of, we've got sort of five or six key areas here and looking at those from uh, lower income households. So those that their, their total income is less than 16,000 and those from sort of higher income households. And just looking at the kind of difference in these sort of five or six key areas between those that get involved in sport kind of once a month, those that are accessing volunteering, those that are getting involved with clubs, so they might have a membership of a sports club, those that are accessing sport and sport coaching, and those that are getting involved in organised competitive sport. So looking at these two households, if we're thinking about a percentage, a percentage and I'd just like you to pop this in the group chat, what sort of percentage less do you feel like that young people from a lower income household might be getting involved in these sort of five or six key areas? So what sort of percentage less might be participating once a month, might be volunteering, might be involved in a club, getting coaching, being in organised competitive sport? So John's in there early, 30% less. Johnny's thinking 50%. Yeah, some high numbers coming in now as well. Yeah, down to 14. And we're going on an average really across each of these five areas because they do vary slightly as well. So we'll just have a look. So just looking at all of those, we're looking at generally on average about 50% less in all of those four or five areas. Um, and, that, and that's really significant, isn't it? And I know, you know, that there is a large gap in the difference in those households there as well. But I think what's really important as well is just to pick up on that first one. So those that are getting involved in absolutely no physical activity or sport, we're talking nearly 50% of young people from low income households. So 50% of those young people are not involved in any sort of sport whatsoever. And those compared to more affluent households, you know, we're talking a lot less. So only 20% are not involved in any sort of sport or physical activity. 
So this is one of the reasons why I really sports the street games as a charity was put together because we wanted to bridge this gap. You know, there's a huge amount of work there, but actually it's important that young people have access to these range of opportunities. So it's not just about them having access to, to sport to play. It, you know, they, you know, it's about how do we bridge that gap so that they can volunteer? What are the barriers in place that stop them from volunteering? You know, what are the barriers in place for them being involved in a club or having the chance to take part in organised competitive sport? So this is one of the fundamental reasons, really, that we explored this as an area. So just in the chat box for me, I would like you to have a think about and also thinking about what your young people are facing now, what are some of the barriers that might face, that young people face in order to get involved in sport generally? So just either unmute yourselves or you can pop it in the group chat. Have a think about what are those barriers that stop young people taking part in sport and physical activity? Yeah, absolutely straight away in there. Cost, cost of sessions, cost of facilities. Yeah, Johnny, definitely. So probably now more than ever, it might be mental health. It might be that anxiety of kind of making that step back into physical activity. Yeah, so support 100% Neil, such a big thing that I think where people have it, they'll take that for granted, that support from family, that travel. Absolutely. So health conditions, you know, parents at work during that time where that support's needed, definitely. Lack of a local offer, I really like that, Darren, yeah. So, yeah, young carers, so caring needs in the house, access, lack of confidence, 100%. Quality facilities, yeah, absolutely. So the right facilities for the activities we want to deliver, yeah, definitely, Mark, that not feeling welcome at mainstream club, mainstream clubs and I think you know what I feel like that is on the change I think mainstream clubs are starting to ask themselves are we providing an app you know an offer that is accessible and is there anything that we can be doing so we'll, we're seeing much more um, you know many more kind of NGBs asking those questions well yeah cost of kit so there's lots of different things that might be a barrier to stop some of our young people participating so what I'm going to do just for a couple of minutes is I'm going to pop you into some breakout groups and um, we are going to have a look at some different motivations. Let's just have a look at this. Uh, let's pop you into some smaller groups and just in your groups, I just would like you to have a conversation about our young people's motivations to participate in sport. So thinking about the young people that perhaps you work with directly and we probably are going to have a range in the room so I think it'll be really valuable to, to hear some of your uh, motivations of your young people so what might motivate them to be involved in some of the sport that you might put on a couple of minutes just in your groups I think you should be asked to join a group shortly just click join and then it should zoom you out into a virtual breakout space um, but welcome back team, I think we've got everybody in, um, hopefully you had a couple of minutes just to chat within your groups. It would be amazing if someone that could unmute the, themselves out of your group would just be happy to feed a couple of things back. What sort of things did you find uh, that young people, you know, that your young people's motivation to be involved in sport in their areas? Just let us know your name and where you're from as well, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah, go on then, I'll jump in first. Um, so yeah, myself and Mark um, Cordula were just talking about, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm from, I'm from Newcastle for the start, from the start, so up in the northeast, um, work in a DSA role, doing some tutoring for street games, but also run my own projects, power through sports. We do minority sports, so things are a bit different, roller skating, roller hockey, ball hockey, those kind of things. Um, in terms of motivation, about was even more so the, the impact of the pandemic and although I guess our kids are always motivated in terms of social opportunities, having fun, improving mm -hmm. the mental well-being, all the kind of the go-tos, if you will, I think over the past 18 months, everything's just been amplified. So I think there's a greater need for social interaction. We're seeing a lot of, uh, I think a lot of young people feel like they've been isolated over the past kind of 14 to 16 months and any opportunity just to talk and socialise. So I'm, I'm seeing the social element's been a much bigger 
the young people. Um, again, just looking at especially mental health being more prevalent now and having bigger kind of barriers to get over in terms of re-engaging some of our young people. So we spoke a little bit about just how the scene's changed, if you will, over the kind of last 15 months. Yeah, no, that's great, Johnny. And I think everything has to have a, a bit of a COVID lens, doesn't it? Because I think uh, all the work that we've done, you know, what what our young people need now is going to be slightly different. You know, although the fundamentals are still the same for provision, um, it is looking at what those needs are now and how they have changed um, within what we're offering. So, yeah, thanks, Johnny. appreciate that. Um, have I got someone that is in that was in Amy or Nicola's group that could just feedback a few things about the motivations that you discussed? Yeah, I'll happily feedback. Um, it was quite interesting. It, it kind of fell into both sides of it. So the motivations for people to get involved were to kind of improve their fitness, um, to have that social element and to um, like improve their mental health. But um, similarly, I work for an FE college and it seems to be that actually that's the reason why people aren't getting involved as well because they mm. don't have good body image. They um, don't have the confidence. Uh, they're scared of socializing. They don't want to. So it was a, a dual edged sword. And then mm. um, Nick mentioned about uh, the cost element as well after um, you know you've had all your free home workouts and you've learned that you can do joe wicks in your two meter bedroom or whatever and then now you're gonna have to pay for your gym membership so yeah not all motivations probably demotivation yeah yeah and it's interesting isn't it because actually are there you know are there things that can provide us with wider access to opportunities in some of that um so you know is there a bit of an opportunity to pull the best bits um i know that we've been working on a project around using yoga um, in the last year and actually there's been lots of access to home yoga uh, and we've had probably the highest uptake of training that we've had because more women have been able to access our trainings it's quite interesting looking at how the online offer there might be opportunities to take some of those elements so you're right it's definitely going to be a double-edged sword there's going to be some you know pros and some cons and it's like is there anything that we can pick apart, pick apart from that so yeah Amy thank you that's really valuable just to sort of feedback could we have just one last person from a group that might just uh, be able to feed in anything kind of different, anything different that might have popped up from a motivations point of view? Um, our provision's a bit different because we're really outdoor learning. We don't actually do sports, but we're doing some detached work now, which is why I was interested more in this. But I think one of the things that does draw our young people in is just having a relationship with adults. It's about the leaders. If there's a good relationship with the leaders, they come for that company and that input. Yeah. And that's a really big motivation. Yeah, yeah. You know what? That's really important. And it's thing is something that we'll, you know, we, we'll really touch on later on in this session. I think realistically, if you've got a strong connection with that role, you know, with that role model, with that leader, with that coach, sometimes it could kind of be irrelevant what the activity is, you know, or, or the, the focus of the activity, because you're doing it as being part of something greater or that connection that you have with that lead that's uh, involved. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just how things can stop us from participating, really small things can stop us. It can be really easy things like, you know, your coach reaching out and just sort of saying, I've noticed that you weren't at the session, you know, come, come along next week. Little things like that can just really kind of encourage people back in. So, yeah, really value that. Thank you. Um, we're going to just have a look at some of the things, I suppose, when we very first started um, on this journey um, that came up for our young people. So these were some of the things that came up for males and some of the things that came up for females. And I think probably what's really important to ask is, and this is a question really for you guys, if any of you have got any thoughts, just unmute yourselves or pop it in the group chat. How do we really truly know what the motivations of our young people are? So, the, you know, some young people have told us that these are theirs over time, but how do we truly know what they are for our group? Any thoughts? Ask them or speak to them regularly. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely, Johnny, isn't it? Um, you know, we, we're working with such wide ranging groups on different backgrounds, different cultures, different interests. You know, we can sort of say the, these are generally the common themes that are coming up. You know, 
keeping fit, having fun, socialising really do seem to come up high on the priorities, on the motivations for getting involved. But absolutely, those things are going to change depending on the group that you're working with, depending on the time that you're working with them, depending on what's going on in the world as well. You know, so absolutely, you know, these things are coming up as some of the things that are real key to doorstep sport and what's important for our young people. But, you know, they will change and it will be dependent on the group that you've got and where they're at in their lives. So, yeah, absolutely. So we're just going to play you a short video now. And I think what I might just need to do is I'm going to have to share that again. So we've definitely got sound here. And this just gives you, I suppose, a bit of a snapshot of the work that street games have been doing, um, but also really about touching on a little bit more of the, the why behind we, why we're doing doorstep sport. Um, if you could just give me a quick uh, thumbs up just to let me know that the sounds on that would be amazing. If you're a kid around here, you feel pressured, a bit scared, a bit worried, wary, gangs, being out of school, jobless. It's, it's hard knowing that there's not a lot of opportunities for the kids to do something that they lack in a proper facility. The young people that we work with live in the most deprived areas of the country. They are often far less active and have far less opportunity to get involved in sport and physical activity than their more affluent peers. There aren't the same sports clubs, the same leisure centres. They also have barriers to getting involved because they don't have the money or they don't have the parental support. The mission of Street Games is about changing the lives of disadvantaged young people who live in our most deprived communities through the power of sport and physical activity. We work with local organisations right in the heart of disadvantaged neighbourhoods to get children and young people involved in regular sport and physical activity. We call it doorstep sport. It's about providing it at the right time in the right place, in the right style, often for free, and led by the right people, local people that the young people will trust to get them involved in a positive activity and keep them playing sport. We work in deprived communities to try and give young people a chance at sport, a chance at life. It teaches them to be confident, to be bold, to be passionate about something. They learn how to meet new people, teamwork, build confidence skills, communication. They become better as a person. Sport is important because it teaches us that individually we can do a lot, but as a group we can do more. It also brings great opportunities for them in terms of a sense of belonging to their local community, feeling like they're part of something bigger, and actually the chance to have fun and enjoy themselves. I think for these young people it just makes them far more resilient, far more able to cope with the many challenges that they face because of where they live and their backgrounds, far more able to plan for the future, far more able to aspire and to make a real difference to the others around them and just to set themselves up to have a different future. gives you a little bit of an idea there about some of the things that we're just going to talk a little bit more about in detail about what that offer looks like and what that right offer is um you know for young people in the areas that we are working in you know what do we need to overcome what do we need to put in place what do our programs need to look like you know they need to be carefully crafted they need to understand the needs of the young people that you know, in those areas and need to understand those barriers that are specifically affecting the young people in the areas that, you know, some of you will be working in. You know, and at times they'll need quite a targeted approach. So some of the things that we're looking at are these five rights. So sport being delivered at the right time, 
you know, and that may well depend, you know, the group that you're targeting, some of the work that you're doing. It's being delivered in the right place. So, you know, central to the community, places where people can walk to that are really accessible, that young people feel safe at. Being delivered at the right price, you know, whether that's being heavily subsidised, completely funded. Being delivered in the right style, and we're going to pick that a little bit further apart you know what does that style look like how does that differ from traditional sports club settings you know what different things need to be in place how does it need to feel and then I suppose really building on all of those four who are the right people that, to be delivering um, you know this provision um, I think Mark will have highlighted it in that video you know role models in the community people that are embedded within the community that know how those communities work that understand those barriers those challenges you know, potentially those conflicts going on in those areas, you know, that have connections with others in those areas that can signpost those young people onto other opportunities where they might not have those things that those young people want to move on to. You know, can they really connect in and, and you know, be a signposter within the community as well as providing that sports provision, um, you know, that they might have stepped into. So we're going to pick that apart a little bit further and just look at each of these four or five areas um, and do like I say a little bit more of an explore and get some feedback from you guys as well so just I suppose looking at the right time um, we've got a few examples here perhaps of some of this taking place one of the things that comes to mind for me is some of the work that I used to do in Burnley which was God a long time ago now um, but we used to you know there's quite a, a large um, Muslim community in Burnley and we used to do a lot of work around Ramadan around changing the time of night that we put on our activity provision so it got moved later on a Friday night so that some of the young lads that wanted to be involved in the football leagues that we had on at that time could, ac could access that around the times that Ramadan was taking place so they could you know get home they could have something to eat and then they could come to that session and that session was quite late at night it was almost like a twilight slot that was sort of like 10 till 12 in the evening so depending on the young people or the people that you are targeting you might time time your activities to fit in with what's going on we've got a good example in the bottom left hand corner of a group of young mums um project reached out to them to ask what what timing would be right for them and they kind of came back and said well just after the school run you know we're out already we're already ready for activity if you were to put something on at that time that sort of nine till ten o'clock that would be the best time for us so sometimes it's not about necessarily thinking about what time slots you have available it's what is right for the group of people that you're trying to engage with um, and that's not always straightforward but it is about having that connection with your group or reaching out and asking those questions so thinking about right place we've got a few different examples on here and I always like this one at the top left as well is that you know what is the right place what makes it right for the young people in that community something that's really local that's safe, you know, that is accessible, you know, considering any conflicts that are going on as well in those areas. Um, we've had a, a group, a project that we've been working with down in Swindon uh, over the last year, and they had some really challenging circumstances when the first lockdown took place. There was some quite significant knife crime taking place in and around where their facility was. And some of their young people were having to walk down an alleyway across two areas that were having some conflict. So some of the youth workers were chatting to us about some of the work they were having to do about having to meet their young people um, at a meet point and kind of walking them down to their venue so that their young people felt safe Well, that conflict was kind of really rife during the summer. So it's not just necessarily about thinking what's the right facility, you know, or is our facility local? It's, you know, how are young people getting to that facility? You know, is the, you know, it is the, the route that they're taking safe for them to come? Do they feel comfortable taking that? And there's been also some examples where groups have worked with the local council to make sure that alleyways have got floodlighting so that people do feel comfortable with those access routes as well. So the right place is not just about the locality, it is about how you're getting to and from those as well. And also just bearing in mind any, any sort of conflicts that might be going on in and around those venues too. And I think sometimes as well, it's just shaking up our, our views on what the space needs to have. I think this example on the bottom left hand corner is really quite a good example of this about some um, aerobic type activities taking place in what looks like a community centre. And I think that's it. It's what, 
what can we make work how can we adapt our act activity for the place that's most suitable for our, our groups just coming on to our advice now so the activities that we've been offering or that we'll encourage to offer are, are, are low cost or funded or free so where possible um you know we want to be looking at a small amount you know is there an opportunity to offer something funded the thing there's pros and cons of both so we've got a group in Wigan that offer like a 50p Friday so it's an activity where you can come you can come and do climbing you can come and do BMX there's an opportunity to do things like table tennis so there's a mix of multi-skill activities you pay 50p and you just come for the evening and you can pick and choose and do a mix of all sorts of things so it's it's thinking about how we can make that accessible uh, and you know where there's families there's larger numbers is there opportunity for flexibility within that where you know that families are struggling just a quick one just thinking about the right price um families have a lot less for physical activity over a period a week have anyone got an idea that the amount that our average family from a low income household has to spend on physical activity for the family for a week and this is on average this is um, but if you could pop it in the group chat or unmute yourself anyone got any suggestions some of you have done this before but yeah unfortunately uh yeah you know unfortunately that you know those that have popped those in are right so we're looking at about three pound twenty for your average family from a low income household um, and as you can imagine that is um you know i don't even think you can get one person going to a swimming session for the cost of that these days um, and that's probably me going back 10 years since i've actually been to a swimming venue um so thinking about how what you know what that means for sport and what that means for those families spending that money on sport and physical activity you know we want to be taking that into account when we're, when we're setting our um opportunities up. I think some of the good examples that I've come across as well are where people have done like fundraising opportunities. So it might be that they do uh, a monthly fundraising opportunity that raises a bit of an income for a particular session. Often it is a bit of an opportunity to get some buy in from um, your young people as well, get them contributing to the session and feeling like they've, they've perhaps contributed towards that. So there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, Johnny or Mark, have you got kind of any examples of sorts of things that you've done with some of your projects in the northeast around like funding or how people have funded some of your activities, especially where I suppose I've got larger families as well? I always remember Kel when I first started working in the West End of Newcastle, uh, and it was probably 15 years ago, that one of the sessions taking place, they were charging the kids 20 pence. And I was kind of thinking, what's all that about? 20p isn't going to go very far, even if we get 20 kids. It's not even going to pay for the coach for half an hour. Like, why? And, I, and one of the coaches explained to me that it was just about placing value on physical activity so that young people are getting used to the fact that it does cost and they're getting used to budgeting. Mm. And if that means that they get a packet of crisps less on the way there or something else, you know, that they've got to try and look after their money and, and put value on the cost yeah. of physical activity. So I thought that was quite interesting, really, just as a principle amongst mm. young people, even though it might not make a huge difference. Obviously, over the weeks, it'll add up a little bit. But that was one of the lessons that I've learned that I think is important. That yeah. And sometimes when you offer stuff for free, you might not have the same levels of commitment. So it's, it's a tricky balance, isn't it? Because actually mm. a lot of young people genuinely can't afford even anything to come along. So I think you've got to know your audience. I think if you can strike up a relationship with the parents and speak to them, I think that's really important. And I think that even if you do put a, a nominal or minimal charge on, I think being really honest with the parents that cost will never be a, a barrier and that you'll always try and get the young people in. And I think that's that's really important. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I could just see Johnny nodding as well there. <laughs> no, 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 I was just going to say, I'm more so from at McGurk, it's the personal project I'm involved in. I guess what we see is it, it, there's always a, a balance between almost income generating activities and also then the free activities for engaging with the community. And obviously that's where we have our biggest impact and that's the priority. However, in reality, there has to be some form of fundraising element so that we can continue to subsidise those kind of programmes. So. Yeah. 
So that would just say it's a balance between where we can maybe generate some commercial income to then subsidize those kind of programs which are reaching those hard to reach kind of private communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it just highlights there, doesn't it, that flexible, flexible approach, you know, and, and finding some sort of middle ground as well, where there are some activities that are put on that are fully funded and where there are other activities that young people have the chance to either contribute or fundraise as well. So, yeah, absolutely both. Thank you. Uh, just one of the things I picked up when I was working on the Theos Girls um, programme was around um, some tactics that projects kind of used around like bring a friend for free, those kind of incentives which yeah. which actually work really well and kind of a, have the best start. Hopefully that then will encourage them to bring a friend and then to mm. bring a friend as well. So it has kind of a twofold um, impact. Yeah, absolutely love that, Helen. And I think it probably, that last point of yours probably touches on then as well, that rice style, you know, so particularly for, um, and, and it is stereotypical, but from the research that we found, you know, particularly when you're looking at women and girls, they are more likely to engage if they can bring a friend, you know, not only because that social aspect is important, but also it's about feeling confident and comfortable you know, coming into a new setting, coming into a new venue, coming into a new place where you might not know people, that opportunity to bring a friend for free, you know, actually has more of a value than it does about money. It's also about, um, you know, feeling able to, feeling confident to, feeling comfortable to. So thinking about that lifestyle, what does sport delivery look like in a doorstep sport? And as you can probably see from all of those, these photos, you know, it's a real multi-sport offer, a mix of delivery, um, less so about skills and drills and performance development, although it can be, you know, and there can be that element of development, you know, that focused foremost is we're coming back to what we talked about at the start of the session, so fun, you know, can we bring people together, can they socialise, do they have the opportunity to take part in things that perhaps they've never done before, so bottom left-hand pitch, you can see a great sort of penalty shootout but you know in a, in a bit more of a fun environment so if anyone's been involved over the years we used to do some really great uh, multi-sport um, street games festivals where you could come and try all sorts of different things from things like BMX um, you know to skating to some fencing you know it was a real sort of come and try opportunity to get involved in something completely new um, and that style has probably really evolved over time. You know, it, it, it might have started off as something. It might have started off having that real sort of focus on fun and socialising. And, you know, when you've got that buy-in from young people, it might have then, you know, might have evolved. It might have become more competition focused. There might have some of those other elements of sport might have come into play. They might have had a go or found something that they liked and decided that, you know, actually boxing was for them and they want to have a go at that a little bit more so. So that style has definitely evolved over time. Um, and I think probably what fits in really well with that is around who it is that's delivering this. Um, you know, we're not necessarily about sport focus. And I think probably that the fencing highlights this as well. You know, in some of our traditional sports, we might be quite fixed in our mindset about what that needs to look like, what equipment is needed, you know, what, what we have to have in place for that. But, you know, that right style is about challenging more, you know, do you need those things? There's nothing better than delivering some activities. I was like out with a group of apprentices the other day and we were playing some, uh, what are called like striking and fielding activities. So they're basically like your rounders, your softball, your cricket. And almost what we did was mix up all of those activities, put them into one, give our young people the chance to kind of pick the equipment that they want to use that's going to give them the best chance of success. So if someone wanted to pick up a tennis racket to play, they could do that. If someone wanted to pick up a cricket bat, they could do that. If someone wanted to use a rounders bat, you know, it's more about that choice and that confidence and building a bit of an opportunity to have some success rather than being specific about, you know, we're playing rounders and we've got our four posts and, you know, we're going to use the same amount of equipment. So it is about mixing it up, having a go and being less uh, confined by perhaps the rules of traditional sport. And I think when we start having that approach, you actually realise the flexibility you have as a deliverer to deliver within these areas as well. So we're going to take a look at deliverers now a little bit more so. And what the right before you move on to that one, like. 
Yeah, I'm yeah. Just bringing, I was just going to say for just about the right style, just again reflecting on kind of previous work with um, particularly with women and girls. I think what we found, and if you look at those pictures, you know, the, the barriers around clothing. So if you saw the girls there that were dancing in a fencing suit in the rug boots, brilliant, because that's what they wanted and that's what they were comfortable in. And that was, you know, and that particular picture was part of a um, multi-sport festival in Wigan. Um, where they got the chance to try loads of different things. And I think similarly, you know, the, the image of the girl playing football with a handbag on her shoulder, she didn't want to leave a handbag there. She said, no way am I leaving my handbag, I've got my phone in it. All kind of health and safety, you know, but carry on, carry on and, and get involved with that. And I think the other thing that I've really learned over the last few years is the, the wraparound stuff, so the music, the social, food is really important and, you know, young people want, drinks and refreshments and so it's it's the holistic approach isn't it mm. where yes physical activity in the in the idea what is the core but actually it's everything else that makes that experience and I think it's giving the young people that that experience means that they will they're more likely to enjoy it and they're more likely to carry on and come back yeah absolutely Helen definitely um, and that probably plays quite nicely into what we're just going to have a look at. We're going to pop you into some groups to just explore yourselves. It's just that fifth right that we talked about, which was around the right people. So who are the people that are delivering these activities? So we've got activities being delivered at the right time, you know, in venues that are central to the, those in the heart of the community. Um, that are being delivered in the right style, so that's focused on fun, social you know, that's got good vibes, like Helen's just sort of said, you know, that kind of wider package that's going on at your venue. Who are the right people to be delivering that? You know, who are going to provide your young people with, um, you know, the best session, you know, that they can chat to, that they can connect with, you know, that they can provide a variety of different things. How do they perhaps differ from maybe what we might have in our minds of like more, in a more traditional sports setting? So we're going to explore that a little bit. And I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes, just in the same groups that you were in before, just to have a think about what are the skills that those deliverers need? What's the knowledge that those deliverers need in order to deliver on those, to, to deliver on those four rights that we've just explored or, or looked at a little bit further? Yeah, brilliant. Great to, great to see that everyone used kind of every last second of time then just to have those chats. So. Hopefully it means there were some really valuable things coming back out of them. Um, I wonder whether room one, so either Esther, Johnny, Mark or Moynal could just unmute yourselves and just feed in some of the things that you discuss or that you kind of feel from some of the work that you do. Uh, I'll jump in because I didn't actually mute myself again, so that's handy. Um, we talked about um, the right person is someone that really relates to them relates to the group um yeah. and and i mentioned sort of previous experience not focusing on rewarding the sort of typical if you've scored a goal in football rewarding for that it's, it's actually getting behind the enthusiasm and the engagement of the people that you're with that's what you reward because mm. they're far like far more likely to come back um, and enjoy themselves and, and actually then Helen's point suggests to their friends to come along as well. So um, definitely that. And then Esther was saying about um, having sort of a young leader or someone within that group of people as almost <laughs> like a, um, a second co-host, I think she termed mm -hmm. it as, um, just to sort of make the rest of the group feel a little bit more comfortable as well. Yeah, yeah, and that and that really can add value as well because not only is that then a development opportunity for that young leader, or, you know, you you're setting a pathway for them to develop, but it is also you know helps with that building that confidence in your group for sure. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Really like that's a suggestion. So thank you. Um, can I come to group three? So I think it was John, Nigel, and Phil. Anyone would like to just uh, unmute yourselves and just feed in that group's thoughts? That'd be great. Um, like Nigel, you're primed and ready without know, your own. <laughs> I, I've just I've fallen into the trap like Mark did. Um, <laughs> forgot to mute. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we had a, a decent discussion of three different sports, really, so it's quite different. Um, but 
very similar uh, skills and um, needs really from a coach in terms of um, understanding, um, having empathy. Um, the safety aspect was prevalent. I'm, I'm a hockey coach, Phil's a squash coach, John's a rugby coach. So um, we talk about giving the kids weapons and uh, you need to manage that, facilitate that appropriately, but um, without being too kind of authoritarian, I suppose, and um, just getting on top of it and making sure it's fun. Um, I think we, we discussed around that safety around other coaches and teachers and things having that being a major barrier um, that they're not knowledgeable enough to be able to manage each different sport and things like that. So getting kids involved in, in sport without that knowledge is difficult. Um, what else we talk about? Um, yeah, having fun, not taking yourself too seriously as a coach. Um, if you're not enjoying your coaching, then the kids aren't going to be enjoying it themselves. So, um, yeah, if you're too strict and things like that, then... Yeah, definitely, Nigel. I suppose a bit of a question to you and your wider group. Do, do, our, do our deliverers have to have knowledge in the sport? Not necessarily. I wouldn't say so. I think um, if you know how to coach, then you yeah. can coach anything. Um I think it's more not about the sport, it's about how, how you engage with the people, the participants. That makes a good coach. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about those how to coach skills rather than some of the, yeah. you know, the sport specific. Yeah, absolutely, Nigel. And I think you're right, aren't you, that if you've got some of those skills of building those relationships, um, you know, setting boundaries, even some of your safety aspects that you can get that your fundamentals and that focus of fun. Um, you know, you, you can adapt your activities regardless of what they are. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks for that, Nigel, and that group. Can I come back to, I think it was our last group, number five, so Amanda, Nicola, and, and I don't, don't know who's on Scott's World Guard, and I think it's just coming up with our name, so. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get it to change the name this morning. I'm Nikki. Um, and now I've unmuted myself. I guess that's also volunteered me, hasn't it? Yeah, thank um, you very much. <laughs> so um, I think some of the conversations we had were um, around just making sure that you that the young people. And I know it's been in the chat there as well about you're responding to what the young people are really enjoying or really engaging with, or taking note of you know if they're always arriving late or if they're always hanging around before the session. Do you maybe need to change the session times and things like that? So it was just kind of really tuning into some of that stuff. And sorry, I didn't make notes, and now I can't remember what the no, others. Well, the really good things before that, <laughs> I can't remember what they were. Those, those are super valuable, and if you think you're right, and you know, like you know, it's almost less of a focus on the detail of the that activity and more of like some of the stuff that's going on in and around the session you know you're right you know are, are they coming in halfway through or are they hanging behind you know after the session because I think that's a real telltale sign that either I've got something they want to talk to you about or you know they've not got anywhere else to go or you know or, or purely just that they want to perhaps get a bit, a bit more involved so it is isn't it picking up on some of those sort of signals that you know might tell you a little bit more about um, the wider picture of what's going on in young people and actually we're sort of saying that you know that, that's as important you know as the sessions uh, that you deliver um yeah, yeah appreciate sorry, that those bits. came from a wider conversation about just communication generally how are you communicating with the group and how are you listening responding yeah and Nicola was talking about uh, the communication and getting it right for the age group that you're working with yeah oh, and one what of the other it? conversations was around um male and female coaches as well and where that kind of gender relationship can have a really big impact mm, yeah absolutely Helen were you going to jump in there yeah I was just going to a recent example from a project IMO charity in Blackburn um that have recently done had some investment through Sporting Women's Tackling and Qualities Fund um working with a group of girls and one of the ways that they kind of consulted in a very informal way with the girls was to just organize a walk so they used the local canal had a small group had a walk really informal and just talked to the girls talked to them about what's going on in their life what had changed you know what they were worried about what they were happy about what they want and by the end of that conversation they all decided that they wanted to give I think it was boxer size ago but that that wasn't a formal conversation. It was just, it was a chat with a safe space with a, a trusted um, leader 
who actually, and I think I think we find lots of um, examples of this, is quite often when an individual, whether a leader or a coach, has kind of a youth work background and a coaching background, that that mix yeah. of goals is often where it works really well because mm. they have the kind of the coaching and, and that side of not that knowledge, but actually the the empathy and the understanding and the, the methods to engage. Um, and then I guess linked to that, one of the one of the terminologies I always remember again from working with, in the Eels Girls program was the term hidden coaching. And uh, you know, that where young people don't even know they're being coached, they're just playing and having a good time. Mm-hmm. And the way that the coach is delivering that session is they are being coached, they just don't know it. It's kind of hidden. And I always remember that. I think actually that's that's quite an easy way to understand and to explain that. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. And I think uh, I think like one of one of you guys sort of highlighted that, you know, instead of sort of recognizing where that success has taken place or whether there's been, you know, um, you know, wins or goals or kind of recognizing that actually, are there other ways that we can celebrate some of that or can we do it more subtly so that people that perhaps are less able are less confident still feel that they are getting some success and that is being recognized because I think it's so easy isn't it you know in traditional sport that we we recognize some of the wins the goals the uh, you know where people have you know had some skill and actually you know some of the young people that we want to you know build confidence in perhaps are lacking some of that so yeah I think it's really really important that that kind of thought around hidden coaching um, I think somebody else had their hands up there. Do you want to jump in? I think it's gone down now. Esther, was it? Yeah, me. Imagine it. So Moynal mentioned Taekwondo um, with his groups. And it just reminded me when my son was nine, he went to Taekwondo. And at the time I was a single parent and he was just starting to have his first sort of testosterone rushes, I felt. But being able to give him a role model of this man that was teaching you about power and control probably one of the best things I ever did that and how Mm. much that modeling supports children I just just, you just can't even sort of make up how important it is so I I just think that it's just really you know yeah just thought about an experience of my own that that Moynal just sort of um, made me think of and I just think that as a parent you you know it's so helpful to have you lot doing what you're doing Mm. and that modeling is what you're doing all the time as well as that those soft skills and being being a sort of empathetic leader as well is just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all. <laughs> you know what's really interesting, Esther, about that is just thinking about that timing, isn't it? You know, I mean, I imagine at eleven, it's that time where your son as well is. You know, whatever you probably say at that point, he's probably going to want to go and do the opposite. You know, so as well, it kind of just highlights the importance of having those role models at those really key kind of ages that you know both girls and boys are having you know when puberty hits and they're really pushing away from parents and but the lovely thing about taekwondo is that you're um you're working towards the next belt the next layer so it's structured but you're only competing against yourself so it's not fighting do you know what I mean? and as a sort of you know single parent that I liked that aspect of it but it was very much this he was improving himself and he was gaining self-esteem the better he you know as he went through the process it was hugely formative, I'd say. Mm, absolutely love that. Um, and yeah, a great example again, isn't it, of a, of a different kind of sport as well. You've talked about individual sports there as well as taekwondo and all the martial arts. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'm very conscious of time. We've covered quite a bit of stuff there. And I know that Mark um, is going to be doing a session tomorrow that kind of builds on this. So he's going to look at, um, the five rights and what does that mean right now so how do these you know how have these evolved or how are these changed or or you know what tweaks might we have to make for them given the current um, pandemic so if if things that we've touched on today you feel like have been a value that you would like to know a little bit more or you'd like to sort of see what 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 it means for Dorset sport if we come out of the pandemic it, you know it'd be valuable to either kind of uh, dial into mark session or i'm sure that the recordings will also be available as well so it will just be that opportunity to kind of build on some of the introductions that we've just um started with today um i'm going to pass you back over to helen now she's going to talk a little bit more about um in, you know introduction to the network joining the network what what being a part of the network means um and you know also a bit of an opportunity if that's something that you're not part of already uh, a chance to also do that so 
No, thanks, Carl. Before you share your screen again, I guess it's probably just worth mentioning that normally this session would be, I'd say normal circumstances, would be a three hour, very active face to face um, workshop. So this is like a very, very whistle stop tour. Um, and it's some of the things, obviously, we've had to cut it down for purposes of doing it online, but also from a time perspective as well. So um, the the kind of the face to face three hour workshop is goes into much more depth. It's really interactive. I know that the session that we cut out Cal, because of time was around um, like the good ingredients of a good doorstep sport session and what that looks like. So that touches on things like music, um, refreshment, personal development opportunities. Mm volunteer all of that stuff which is a really again interactive diamond nines type session um so if you know if this is what your appetite or you think well actually you know this would be really great for some of my staff or some of my young leaders to do then there is an opportunity for um for a face-to-face -face version of this um in the future if it's something you're interested in so i thought it'd be just worth mentioning that before we move on well, um, if you can share the, the next couple of slides, Kel, I'll just finish off. Yeah, brilliant. And just leave that quote up just for a couple of seconds as well, because this is something that we kind of refer to quite a lot, but kind of just um, pulls together some of the stuff that we've just talked on there. So, yeah, young people need to know that you care before they care what you know. You know, so it's much more about how you're making them feel rather than the amount, you know, what you're delivering. Well, thanks, Cal. Okay, so I guess I just wanted to, on the back of that, I think probably most of you that are on the AI have some understanding and relationship with street games, but not necessarily kind of part of the street games network. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what what it what it is. What is the street games network? What does it mean? Um, what do you become part of? And this basically sums it up. It's not a we're not a paid for membership organization. I think the way, one of the ways we describe it is it's more like a movement and we want to bring people who share our mission, share our vision, uh, bring like-minded people and organizations together to, to learn things together, to share what they've learned, um, to kind of develop the workforce together, to upskill, to deliver together and to celebrate together. That's basically what we're all about with kind of the, the mission of um, changing communities, changing lives, um, supporting young people to um, develop through and using sport as that vehicle for change. So we're very much, a, you know, we're an open organisation, open to any sector. I think over time, what we found is that the, the types of organisations that make up the Street Games Network don't, don't necessarily have sport as their primary, pers primary purpose. Some do, some don't, but actually they all recognise that sport plays a role in helping to transform communities and to help young people um, kind of create better life chances. So it's much, it's very much a, a network of like-minded organisations that we as Street Games kind of facilitate to, to bring together and to do things together. If you could go on to the next slide, please, Cal. Thank you. Uh, so this is just, a, and I always remember this, somebody presented it a few years ago, and for me, it was just a really simple way of describing kind of what we're trying to do. So Kelly earlier on talked about um, the inequalities in terms of sports, sports involvement and sports opportunity, and the difference between the most affluent and the least affluent. And then again, if you're from a minority group, there's kind of less um, chance of you being involved and less opportunity to be involved. So basically what we're trying to do as Street Games is to fill that gap. So those blue lines there, what we're trying to do as a network, so it's absolutely a Street Games standalone. We're, we're nothing without the network. So with partners, what we're trying our best to do on a day-to-day -day basis is just to really fill that gap to kind of level up the, the opportunity for young people in deprived areas to have the opportunity to be physically active. And I just thought that's a really kind of good visual to just kind of describe what it is that we do. Uh, next slide please, Cal. I feel like I should be on the government's thing about saying that. Next slide please. 
<laughs> so in terms of joining the Street Games Network, again, like I said, it's about what we want is to bring organisations together that share the Street Games vision of healthier, safer, more successful communities through sport and probably be all this morning. You already do something that supports young people from low income backgrounds through physical activity. And if you don't, then you can keen to kind of hear a bit more about how you can be part of the network. And for us, kind of empowering young people is, is at the heart of that. And we've talked about it already today about um, youth voice, listening to young people, listening to what they need and listening to what they want, and then providing them with the opportunities to be involved in that design of what the offer is to meet their needs and how can we involve them as a participant, as a volunteer, potentially as a coach, how can we involve them at that at a very local level that's driven by their needs? Um, and also we talked about today um, how bringing people together just gives us the opportunity to kind of just share amongst the, amongst the network. And I think one of the, we do a network survey every, every couple of years. And one of the things that comes back in terms of value is how valuable it is to just get together with other people other people in a similar geographic area, but actually organisations that are in different parts of the country and, up, and events like this, again, we'd normally do face-to-face, um, -face, just brings people together and gives the opportunity for that informal conversation, sharing, oh, this is what I'm doing, this is what you're doing, that sounds great, can you tell me a bit more about that, I'll share contact details, and that's, that's very much what we're about, is facilitating that connection between organisations that are all working towards a similar mission. So I guess just on to the how. Um, so what, before we get on to the how, so what, what does it mean? What do you get as part of the network? So we talked about doorstep sport today. We have a, um, as part of our um, kind of staff structure, we have what we call doorstep sport advisors who are based in the regions, who work for street games, one, one day a week, two days a month, and they provide that local expert support to other organisations to help develop that doorstep sport offer that we've talked about. So by being part of the network, you kind of have access to that expert support. Um, we've talked about collaboration. One of the things that we kind of pride ourselves on as an organisation as well is, a, is we, we are and want to be a learning organisation. So everything we do is kind of based on research, based on insight. We're constantly testing and learning, testing and learning and producing um, kind of resources to help others to share what we've learned and then to help, help them to kind of implement that locally. Um, so as part of the network, you're able to access that. We have a uh, a monthly newsletter called Word on the Street, which again provides, shares ideas, shares learning and provides information on any upcoming opportunities, whether that's investment opportunities, um, opportunities to be involved in test and learn type projects, for example. And we have a, a kind of a, a huge range of courses um, and accredited qualifications through the Training Academy. Um, and, Kelly and Mark and, and the team have worked really hard over the last 12 months to bring some of those face-to-face -face workshops online. So we've now got a real range of um, accredited workshops, um, three-hour activator, some more practical type workshops, um, some of which are around multi-sports, multi-skills, some are more sports specific. But we've now also got a range of courses that are specific to a theme. So whether that's community safety, whether that's um, young people's mental health, whether that's uh, youth social prescribing. We've got a whole range of kind of newly developed content and courses. And they're all, we kind of, they're all kind of delivered in a similar way to how this has been delivered today. So very informal, very interactive. Um, and again, try what, what we're constantly trying to do is take that learning, research and insight to make sure that the content of the courses is constantly updated using um, practical examples from across the network to really kind of illustrate um, some of those examples. And then access to funding and investment. So what we, what we purposely don't do is kind of lead with that as a joint street games to get access, potential access to investment. Because actually I think what, what people are telling us that, yes, sometimes the money 
often the money is great and really helpful for whether it's um, to help you with engagement or delivery or helping you sustain your organisation. But actually, investment coupled with support and advice is more probably more beneficial. Um, so basically, as, as part of the Street Games Network, when we get opportunities for investment, a member of the network will pass those opportunities on to you. So there's kind of, if you just go to the next slide, please, Cal. In terms of joining the network, it's kind of a two-step approach. It's a come and join us. And that just explains really quick. Um, if you go onto the website, there's a join us page, click the join us um, button. It will ask, ask you to answer a few quick questions around your priorities, um, the purpose of your organization, why you're joining the street games, and then depending on where you're based, a member of the, re the appropriate regional team or the national team will be in touch. Um, have a conversation with you about how you can join in and it's that simple once you're part of the network there's then the opportunity to um, apply for investment as and when kind of programs and intervention come online and it's at that point where we'll ask a few more in-depth questions around um, kind of policies practice safeguarding those those kind of um, due diligence type checks will be at that stage but in terms of joining the network it's just a case of um, Tell us you want to be part of us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll connect you into the right people. And it's as simple as that. So has anybody got any questions on that? Yeah. Feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself. No? 